Okay, good. So let's start. Um, yeah, what does the Scrum Master do with the PO if he, if he thinks the PO doesn't talk? Jeff, John, can you come up here, please? Both of you. Yeah. Can you stand? It's more likely that you're going to answer the question. You have any ideas on this, John? I have no idea. <laughs> 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 There's actually a pattern on this. There's a Scrum's Patterns community that's been working for some years now, and, and the published patterns are at scrumplop.org. And in, in there, there's a pattern called proxy owner, proxy product owner. And what it says is, if you don't have a product owner, you have to create one. So in the best case, it would be the customer. If you can't get that, then you would have someone in the company, in the business, you get that. If you can't get that, then you keep on backing up into the IT organization. If you can't get a good one there, you keep on backing up until you're all the way backed up to the team. So in this case, you're saying a situation, the product owner is getting it, not doing the job. Then that means you don't have a product owner and you need to find one. So a scrum master might do some initial coaching because the scrum master is responsible for educating the product owner, training the product owner. So. That would be the, the, the first approach to try to see if you can get someone to understand what the role is, and they might do it. Failing that, then this person is, is not a product owner. They're not going to do the job. They are, they are now in the position as a stakeholder. Stakeholders are people that a product owner listens to when building a backlog. So you need to find a stakeholder. If it... It, it may back away all the way up to the team where you have to exercise a pattern called sacrifice one person to be the product owner. But the scrum will not work without a product owner. It's like trying to drive a car with one of the wheels missing. You'll never get anywhere. So follow the pattern and get yourself a product owner. It's not an excuse that the business product owner is not doing the job. You need to immediately recognize you have no product owner. The business is not giving you a product owner. Therefore, you have to back all the way into the team if necessary to create a product owner. The product owner doing the job has a backlog. It's clear. It's prioritized. It's broken down into small pieces. And the product owner is working with the team to clarify it all the time. That's a product owner. If you don't have one, you need to get one, even if it's a team member. Uh, now, at the same time, a good scrum master is usually doing some negotiation on the side. You know, we've had to make a team member a product owner, so we're sacrificing productivity. Make that clear to manager. That's now a management problem. It's not my problem as a scrum master anymore. That's a management problem. You're losing one of your developers because we have no product owner. Then the manager will say, well, we gave you a product owner, and the scrum master will say, Stop kidding me. Where's the backlog? Where's the prioritization? Where, where is he? He's like a soldier that went AWOL. What do you do with soldiers that go AWOL? What's AWOL? What does AWOL mean? Missing on duty. All of a sudden, they don't show up. Away without leave. That's, that's the American term. Away without leave. They're gone. They have no authorization to be gone. They're missing. What do you do in the Swiss Army? <laughs> you war, you know. kill them. <laughs> <laughs> we don't usually shoot them in the United States, <laughs> but we throw them in the brig. You know, they're going to get court-martialed and thrown in the brig. Yeah. Jeff, a product owner needs to uh, make decisions. Yes. And many times these decisions uh, do cost money. It's about money. So, what level um, of of, of authorization or, or management level does a product owner need to have if you go back to the team these people uh, they don't dare to to take the, to make these decisions it's a problem 
Is he adding backlog in yeah. the middle of the script? <laughs> <laughs> Sneaking in his question. It's a scope change. Uh, <laughs> scope <laughs> Sorry. No torpedoes. If, if we're doing scope change, I am. And uh, maybe the vice versa quickly, just to now we spoke about the okay. product owners. We're training more and more product owners, particularly in the United States, they're realizing how important the product owner is. And so we're doing more and more product owner training courses. And I'm training the product owners in what they should see in a scrum team. You know, product owner wants more stuff as fast as possible. So if you're gonna get more stuff as fast as possible and you walk up and you look at a scrum board and everything's open and nothing's done, you are not gonna get your stuff. And so as a product owner, you ought to start going crazy. Like, I thought I had a scrum team and I got a completely dysfunctional bunch of people that aren't going to deliver anything, okay? And so we go all, through all these patterns that we see constantly as problems with the scrum team and we train the product owner to identify them and actually help coach the scrum master. And the product owner is usually in the business and usually a more powerful figure in the business and they can more easily get the scrum master replaced than the scrum master can get the product owner replaced. So they would probably more commonly resort to that <laughs> strategy. Okay. Next one. Acting PO in an environment. What does it say? With a negative it? attitude towards scrum. It's my word. Okay. Maybe, John, maybe you can say something about that. The product owner is trying to do Scrum in an environment, but the in, in a company, but the people in the company don't like Scrum. They have a negative attitude. That will never work. We don't like it. But the product owner is trying to get the job done. Well, I, I think you know if we, if we go into the state of mind, which I'm always looking at, if I go into an aggressive state of mind, all I'm going to do is alienate. So I had somebody try to force something on me the other day, and he criticized me, and all I did was get my back up. So as a, as, a, as a product owner, I have to keep my I have to keep cool, and I think that's what's really a key issue. You know, I, I can set boundaries, but I've got to be able. It, it's not about losing, getting emotional about it. It's uh, having the ability to say yes, no, with strength. You know? if, if you start screaming and yelling, you'll lose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would I would. Just, the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Product owner is trying to implement Scrum and the com people in the company don't like it. They, they don't think it'll work. They don't want to hear about it. Well, again, if I can keep cool, if I, if, 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 if I can go to them and if I can explain to them, like I've had to come here to you today. I had to explain to you I had to keep cool. I have to be in control of myself. That's what it's all about. It's, it's, and I call it self-sustainability. If I go to the rest of the, of the, of the but the company, I've got to be able to go in and let them see the reason. I've got to stay calm. I've got to stay open focused. As soon as I get into the air and I start pushing and I'm trying to shove them and pull them, it's not going to work. All you're going to do is going to alienate. Yeah. Certainly that's a mental state that needs to be addressed. If I was in that kind of situation as a product owner, I wouldn't call it scrum. I would, I would, I would just say to people, you know, if we were a great company, we'd have such a great product, everybody would have to have it. They would be lining up like they do when the new iPhone comes out. They just want to pay and get one. Is that something that this company is interested in? And then if they said, well, no, then this company's <laughs> gonna suck forever. <laughs> You're never gonna have enough money. <laughs> Why are we working in this company? Maybe we should all quit and go someplace else, you know? <laughs> but usually they won't say that. They'll say, well, yeah, so that's what we're complaining about, and this scrum thing is just going to screw it up, and nothing's going to work. So the, the, so then, but you, you've got a basis of agreement there. We want, we want life to be better. We want a better product. We want to sell more stuff. We want happier customers. Well, then the product owner would say, well, I have an idea that might work and explain it to them because the product owner always has a vision, right? And so a product owner always has to get the t stakeholders agreeing or signing up in some way to an idea that he's going to try to implement. So now you got him, you know, you got him aligned with the vision. You're not calling it Scrum. 
And then, of course, the next step is, well, in order to do that, here's the kind of things that I think we need to do. Do you agree? Yeah, we need, we need all those things. What do you think we should do first? Now he's got the stakeholders building the backlog. He's just leading them down the garden path. You know, built into Scrum are things so basic. I often go into teams, particularly teams outside of software, because in many of our companies now, we have Scrum everywhere. So with the sales and the marketing guys, and they're all asking how we're doing Scrum. And the first thing, question I have them is, do you guys have a clear list of what you want to do in priority order? And they always say no. <laughs> And I said, well, you have to do, have that before you can even talk about doing Scrum. Isn't that like business 101? You, <laughs> you learn that in business. Where were you when they were teaching that? <laughs> then they're all embarrassed. And I say, okay, the other big question before we talk about Scrum is after you do some kind of initiative or marketing campaign, do you look at what happened and analyze what went wrong and how you could do it better next time? And they always say no. <laughs> and I say, my God, you need to go back and whatever book you took in business, read it. And when you understand that, then come and we'll talk about Scrum. We're not ready to talk about Scrum yet. There are things so, so basic. It's business 101. And we have companies right here in Zurich. We were talking to you last night. They said, this company, the management has 10 projects. I mean, I think they had 300 by the time we finished. <laughs> but if they can't get done, 10 done, let's give them 10 more. Maybe one of them will pop loose. <laughs> I mean, where are those managers? Some of them went to business school, but they kind of erased all the information when they left. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that's becoming really clear as we start to implement better scrum teams is that the management is totally out of control. Totally out of control. They're not managing the companies. Now, that, that's, that's not true everywhere because there are some companies like Apple that had some pretty good management. And they did it very differently than companies having 300 projects and everything's top priority. That's not the way Apple worked. That's why they have all the money, okay? So. <laughs> maybe there's a correlation. Yeah, maybe there's a correlation. Yeah, we can get more into that when we talk. Would you, would you also say that some of the old managers now are, are just, they, they've sort of, they've gone to school, they got the job, that's it. There's no effort, there's no motivation, there's no energy. Whereas in, in the new models, what you have is more energy, more motivation, more passion. Whereas mm -hmm. these guys are just sitting there, they're just, you know, they're not, and I think that's what's happening with us today in, 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 in society, is we've given up. We're just sort of saying, okay, that's it. Whereas there's new people coming online with new models, they're saying, they're, there's passion. I want to mm -hmm. change things. I want to yeah. make things better. And I think often when I go out and talk about my stuff, if I talk about it with passion, people buy into it. If I go out and talk about it, say, yeah, this is what I do, and, you know, they don't buy into it. And I think that's, the product owners got to have the passion. No? Yeah, I think certainly that's the case. I don't want to be totally negative towards management, though, because I remember a dinner we had with a guy that was running a business unit in a bank. And he said, I've got 12 other business units beating me up every day. They want their thing done first. Uh, I'm in meetings all the time just trying to wrestle with that problem. And the guys in the scrum teams are, are coming to me demanding that I do all these things because they have their problems. And I don't even have time to think about it. So that made me think, well, the scrum teams ought to be coming to the manager and saying, what's your problem and how can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> and then when you clear, clarify that, then you say, okay, if you do this for me, then I got these other things that I need to be fixed. So it cuts both ways, I think. Mm -hmm. and in terms of not having the passion, there's a famous Jap Japanese movie about a Japanese bureaucrat that at the end of the movie, they name a park after them. Has anybody ever seen that? But he came in every day. He was, he was kind of the administrator in charge. He had this little unit that was creating all this paperwork. And everywhere in the in, you know, he had a room about this size with all these desks, and there's just stacks and stacks of paper piling up. And, and they were keeping track of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, citizens' complaints about parks and buildings, infrastructure for the city. And so they were stacking up all the complaints six feet deep for years, <laughs> but nobody was ever doing anything about it. <laughs> but the, the Japanese guy, he got stomach cancer and he was told by the doctor he was gonna die within three months. So he's sitting in a park, it's snowing one night, and he, a woman sits down and somehow he's an old, she's a younger woman, he's a pretty old guy. She just asks him something and they start talking. And somehow he gets the feeling, I really do, ought to do something for the people of the city before I die, you know? And this talk in the park has moved me so deeply. You know, we need to, we need to fix all the citizens' complaints about the park. They're complaining about, you know, the sewers, it smells, and this and that and the other thing. So he, go back, he goes back to his office and start, pulls out all these complaints with respect to this park, and then he starts going to all the other agencies demanding that they <laughs> fix it. <laughs> and it creates this huge uproar. You know, we were talking about the monkeys pulling, <laughs> all the monkeys tried to pull him off his perch, but he was dying anyway, and he refused. And uh, it was just an example of an older person who had lost all that motivation and was just waiting for retirement. All of a sudden, the confrontation with, you know, dying awakened him. And he just uh, created a huge uproar in that city. And the city council was trying to stop it. And the citizens were so upset, they, they would run into the city council meeting, screaming, crying, demanding, you know, and he became this kind of folk hero. And they fixed the park. So <laughs> it's just a, a, an, an example of what can happen if a person's passion is ignited by some, something that takes them deeper. Um, I'll have to get the name of that movie for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's always hope for everyone. <laughs> Talking about hope. So, more hope if you can give him a five-point program to change a company. Well, Cotter, the professor at Harvard that writes about change, he has an eight-point program. <laughs> Tough luck. You can read that. Can use that. <laughs> You know, my wife is a Unitarian minister, Unitarian Universalist minister, which is a liberal Protestant denomination in the United States, and uh, she's implemented Scrum in half a dozen churches. And her view of life is, you know, some companies or organizations, they don't want to hear about their impediments, they don't want to talk about their impediments, and they're definitely not going to fix those impediments. And those organizations, whether they be churches or corporations, they are in a living hell and they are going to stay there. But there are other uh, companies or organizations, like churches, they'll talk about their impediments. They'll be open about them, but they'll never fix them. And they're in purgatory. You know, it's, uh, are there a lot of Catholics in Switzerland? I don't know. <laughs> the Catholics have this idea of purgatory, you know. Everybody is a sinner when they're alive, so when they die, they can't go right to heaven. They have to go to this place where they do penance. But eventually, they get out of purgatory and they go to heaven, okay? So, these companies that won't fix their impediments, they're in purgatory. But, this is where all the opportunity for all the scrum trainers you know, the scrum trainers can go into purgatory with these companies, they can hold their hand, they can commiserate with them. You know, you can talk about states of mind, <laughs> getting a little rest in meditation. <laughs> and then maybe eventually they'll, they'll snap out of it. But she said there are some organizations, they will not only talk about their impediments, but they will fix them immediately and they go straight to heaven. And for a corporation, the revenue just goes, whoom, they got a, a hockey stick of revenue. So she says, that's the reality of life, and that's the, that's the fundamental, you know, step one of how to change a company. So often when we go in, 
uh, if, if we have, often we now today, particularly in the United States, we have senior management that wants to change the company. Um, even, uh, and I just came from Amsterdam, and I, uh, I, I was at a group like this, and we had guys from ING, a huge bank, and they are massively reorganizing that company with Scrum. It's amazing. Um, and so you, 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 in those kind of cases, you have, you're able to pull together a transition team. I was recently at Philips, and they had a global whole day like webinar with thousands of people. Uh, not, only he, not only in Eindhoven in, 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 in the Netherlands, but China, India, the United States. Uh, the co-CEOs were there. I was there to give a talk. And they had a transition team that was really powerful. People with huge amounts of energy, motivation, knowledge, and th their job is to surface all the issues, get all the impediments on the table, prioritize for that company, and then systematically go after them one by one. Because it's, it's the blocks that are holding the company or the personal ba person back. It's probably some personal understanding related. You know, what blocks a person from becoming the great person that's inside them. Um, that's what you need to get at with the company. And you need to start fixing those things one by one. And as you do, the energy will start to bubble up. And you start to get, you, you start to recruit the power that will transform a company. But without that, without that leadership, it's very hard, maybe impossible to change a company. Uh, Cotter says 70, 70, or 80, 70 to eighty percent of change processes fail because people don't want to change, and change is hard. Uh, it's kind of like giving up smoking. Actually, maybe we're doing better than that with smoking today. I don't know. Uh, but so, one of the five points. <laughs> You know, we could go even deeper than this with John's comments on meditation, brain waves, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, before I got into software, I spent 11 years on the faculty of a medical school. And at, at, the, at the University of Colorado Medical School, they had one of the leading uh, brain wave research biofeedback centers in the country. And so they were always looking for volunteers to wire up and test their brain waves. Well, I had been. Uh, someone who had been meditating ever since I was in Vietnam back in 1966 or 67. Uh, I, was, <clears throat> I was on R&R, &R, rest and recreation. I had an opportunity. They said, hey, we got, a, we got a slot on a plane. You can go to Sydney for a week and get out of all the fighting that's going on in Vietnam. Do you want it? I said, sure, I'll go to Sydney for a week. So I went down there for a week just hanging out, and I wandered into a bookstore looking for something to read. And I, way back in the corner, I was impelled to pick up this book, and it was on Tibetan Buddhism. And so in 19, this is 1967, maybe the beginning of 68, I got interested in Tibetan Buddhism. So by the time I got into the medical school, this is back maybe in the early 80s, late 70s. So many years later, I had been practicing meditation. And so they wired me up. And they said, you know, it's really interesting. You know, you, you drop into a theta state and stay there very quickly, which is, I don't know, you probably know better than I do. It's, you know, you go from beta to alpha, and then you go down, I don't know, what to delta, and then you go down to theta. Theta, you're almost asleep. The, 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 the delta's at the bottom. The theta delta's at the bottom. So the theta's just about theta. delta. Theta, alpha, theta, that's the best first. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in that state, you're almost, you're close to sleep, and it's almost a dreaming state, so the archetypes in the mind can surface. So I, st I spent many years uh, working in psychotherapy, actually doing psychotherapy with groups and individuals, and was a student of Carl Jung, who's a, Carl, Carl Jung is a Swiss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you re study his, you know, he, his, his work is all about archetypes of the mind that will rise up and, uh, and he had an archetype called Philemon, which was a wise old man that was guiding him. So, um, 
around the time around the time that we that we I was on this uh, project trying to build new product and build a new process. <clears throat> I had a coach, a guy named Jeff McKenna, who was a consultant with the team. And we'd go out in an evening like this and we'd talk about, you know, how do you do these projects year after year after 20 years? You've been all these failed projects, all this pressure. How do you keep the, motiv the motivation up? You know, and we'd talk about, well, <clears throat> you gotta connect with something inside you that kind of keeps you going. And what is that? And we just keep talking, we, we keep talking about that. So one night during this, I had one of these uh, Tibetan tankas, which is a picture of one of the, they ha, they, they're pictures of gods and goddesses. These are archetypes in the mind that Jung was talking about. And I'm meditating one night and thinking about all this, and I get this powerful experience where the, 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 the tanka was a goddess and the communication was um, uh, she's known to have a great compassionate heart. So overwhelming light and love and peace and grace. And so you're like in this state, like what's happening? So I don't know what, the, what that does to your brain waves. And then kind of impressions start to flow. And the impression is every person is entitled to be fully open, fully released, and to have abundance shower upon them. All the things you have to lack, all the things you feel you lack, they're there. They're abundantly flowing in the universe. And if you can align yourself properly, they'll be yours. So, this all sounded wonderful. It reminded me of Buckminster Fuller. I, have anybody heard of Buckminster Fuller in here? Mm -hmm. Guy that invented the geodesic dome. Mm -hmm. he, used to, he used to go to universities, you get a big auditorium with hundreds of people in there, and he would talk for eight hours straight. And the core of his message was, Every person on this planet is a billionaire. There's enough resources that everyone is a billionaire, and the only reason we don't feel that way is that there are blocks. There are blocks in the distribution channel, okay? There are corporations that are, you know, cornering the market over here and stopping. You know, the banks are, are messing with the money supply and cutting it off, and it's all about these blocks. So I'm sitting there in meditation, and this goes on many nights. And you know the reason that you don't feel that showering of abundance is that there are blocks. Well, what are the blocks? Well, your life is made up of what you do, and you do certain things and you wind up in a negative state. You do other things, you wind up in a positive state. So here's all the things you're doing that are keeping you in a negative state. And she gives me this laundry list that sounds like all the things my wife has been telling me. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. You know, are you an echo of <laughs> my wife, Arlene? <laughs> but just silence and blessing, okay? So in the midst of all this, we're trying to figure out what became Scrum. So I, I went to the team and I said, you know, we never have enough software. We're always behind. Management is always upset. They're putting us under pressure. Sometimes we can't sleep at night. We've been living that way for years. Do you want to live that way for the rest of your life? Of course, they all said no. <laughs> I said, well, I have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea that might work. And uh, I, I forget how we started, but we took what we knew from computer science and we started implementing it. The first thing I needed, knew we needed a cross-functional team. And that was because of the research at Bell Labs. And then I know we needed to have something at the end of every month that worked. And that was from the Media Lab at MIT. But then as, as we were putting this stuff together, I would come in 
And all of a sudden I would feel emotionally compelled to do something. And it was all about the people and the dynamics of the people. And being an engineer, I was always in my head, you know, intellectually thinking, like, why would I go over and say this to that person or kind of guide this person over into this area? Because I normally wouldn't even think about this, but I, I just felt like I had to. I had no choice. And I knew it was coming out of this meditative experience. And the impression I got is that all of this was put together because people operate in a certain way. It's all psychology. They have families. They're used to working in family dynamics. They work in tribes. And in these environments, they feel totally accepted and okay. And then they have a role. And then they're listened to and they're guided, as you're talking about. And within three months, we had Scrum as we know it today. Where did it come from? People think I thought it up, but I have to tell you, I did not think it up. Something else thought it up. And so it has all these things built into it that have things like these rests you're talking about. They, they fit with the, main sta the, the mental states. They fit with the peace people. And the goddess that I was med meditating on is known as the guardian of the traders on the Silk Road. For thousands of years, she was the guardian spirit of the traders. So she knew about business. And so she just <laughs> directed it where it is. So you are the fortunate people to have the blessing of Scrum because I tell you, that's what I feel. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost for words. I, I, no, I don't need to say it. You said it all. Thank you. Okay. So then you put the five points. That was number two. I'll give my view on the five points. I tried to do it a little bit shorter. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have two, two situations. Either management understands. Scrum and the values behind it and everything, like understands the Agile Manifesto or not. If they don't understand it, you might have to do something like Guerrilla scrum, scrum. You do it like under the covers. You do some metrics. You show some happy customers. Then management, maybe you show to management, maybe they understand Scrum. If they still don't, change job. If they finally get it, then you just take the next step. Um, well, typically you reduce pressure because as we also got the question like how do you focus on a vision where you actually should start if there's lots of pressure you try to reduce pressure so you get some space then you start doing scrum you put a scrum by the book um yeah. it's, it's it's called um, yeah just scrum by the book <laughs> you also you also do metrics on that obviously you measure velocity in particular and then you get your impediments and you make your list of impediments and you work on your impediments and you just get faster and faster. So this is just, this is all again, another way of saying there's a list of things that you and your company are doing that is preventing the company from being break, great and systematically prioritize those and removing them unleashes the power. And uh, that works in psychology, it works in psychotherapy, it works in family dynamics family counseling, it works in your counseling and coaching of people, and it works for teams, and it works for companies. It's, 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 it's a universal dynamic. And there's like lots of psychology in it, of course. You have to go, like everybody is against change, not everybody, but most people are against change. There's like models in that, there's something called the, the Virginia Satir, Satir. change model exactly like where you go to the valley of tears I think they call it uh, you go yeah. into chaos and everything like productivity drops and you have to get through that there's also an Alcoholics Anonymous the 12 step program it's, it's, it's the same thing <laughs> okay let's consider that question answered let's go to time versus story points a non-product owner question well, here's an interesting thing, you know, as soon as you link, like, why wouldn't we just have a story point be an ideal day? And the answer is, how many ideal days do you have in a sprint? 
whatever that number is, that's as fast as you're ever going to go. But I have a team that started at 40 points and last week they did 250. So, so they're doing what they used to do in one ideal day. You know, they're now doing in what's 40 into 250. It's about a factor of six. So they're doing six ideal days in one ideal day. And that's what you want to see. But if you measure an ide ideal days, you can never see that. Not only that, you, can, you know, Scrum is about implementing a process improvement and then seeing a change in production or quality. And if your production measure is ideal days, you can't get any more ideal days. So you do something and your velocity doesn't go up. Even worse, you do something that's going to actually bring it down and it doesn't go down. So it's like you're flying in the blind with no instruments. So these teams cannot get better. And so one of, the, one of our, it's very interesting, I work with a venture capital group, they use Scrum for everything. And the, I, I've been coaching them for five years and they will not get off these hours. <laughs> and as a result, they, they've tripled their production on all their teams. But they will never have a hyperproductive team unless they get away from that because they cannot analyze and measure their progress sufficiently to go to the next level. They're stuck. Okay. And, and we could go. Out, there's a long yes, list of reasons. things. Like long list of things. People agree much easier. Yeah, story yeah, points. Long list of things. Relative, relative measure of complexity. People agree much faster, and you get much better estimates. Uh, there's like, if you have a product backlog and you actually estimate it in the story points, if velocity changes, you don't need to do anything about the product backlog. If you've estimated it in days, you virtually have to re-estimate your entire product backlog every time you get quicker, for whatever reason. Yeah. Also, time, usually you think of a person, if you, if you have to estimate in time, you think of Peter who's going to implement it, because he's really good at that. And then the next task, or the next story, you again think in time, it's again Peter. Unluck unfortunately, Peter can't do all of this uh, of the work. If you measure story points, story points is actually a measure, measurement of how much the team can do and not individuals. If you measure time, it's not the team, it's individuals. And we want to measure how much this, the team can do. And if you measure time, you always forget the meetings, the surprising meetings, the phone calls and all that stuff. And so you forget almost 50% of the time, which it really takes. I had this. Yes. Yeah. yeah the, the other thing, you know, all this started back in the 1940s with the Rand Corporation uh, under contract from the Department of Defense to figure out h how they should estimate technical projects. And the Department of Defense reported back that uh, people are really bad at estimating hours. Their error rate is very high. The difference between experts is very wide. The recommendation was to never use hours. Now, Microsoft has recently replicated some of that work in an IEEE award-winning paper. If you go to my website, scrum.jessup.com, just Google points versus hours, and you'll this will pop up. And in the in the paper, they have the traditional error for waterfall projects, the, the estimation curve looks like this. In the beginning of the project, the estimate will have very wide error, around 400%. As you get more and more into the implementation, you know, when you get the, when you get the requirements clear, it'll drop down to 1% to 200%. And then as you get the technical design done, it will drop down into, the, into a smaller range. Microsoft has several projects, cumulative, showing, okay, here's, the, here's our waterfall with this curve. The, the error band on the points is, is so narrow at the beginning of a project, it's almost as narrow as at the end. So basically, points give you better estimates, and they eliminate a lot of the errors. So, uh, so that's obviously the first uh, thing from a management point of view, is you want to know what the date is. And if you're asking for hours, our investors at OpenView say, you know, most of them have been in this business for 20 years. They have never seen a correct Gantt chart in a board meeting. And they have figured out why the error is 100%, and it's because the management does not know the rate of production of any team in the company. They've checked. Most management teams have no idea 
what the rate of production of any team in their company is. And so those GAN charts are totally made up. They are a fiction, a guess at best. And so that, one of the reasons they decided to implement Scrum is they said, we need to get away from these GAN charts are always wrong. They're costing us a lot of money and we need an estimate based on reality. And understanding the velocity of point delivery in, is a measure of production and we need to know that for every team and every company in our portfolio. So they want Scrum everywhere. It's too bad they won't import, in, implement points internally. I mean, they're, you know, people are schizophrenic, you know? I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> Okay, let's take the last question here. Product on the state of mind, how does he get the team to the same state of mind? How does, he, how does a product owner actually change the state of mind of other people? Can you do that though? Well, I, I would say that the objective is not to change somebody else's state of mind. How I'll change somebody else's state of mind is how I change my state of mind. It's how I come across. And, and I, you know, so the only person I can change is me. But what I can do is I can affect other people by my behavior. Yes? Mm -hmm. And now it's basically what I would be saying. So how, how do you affect you know, the, the team or how do you affect other people in your company? It's, it's your behavior. That's what you have to focus on. It's your self-sustainability. So when I talk about self-sustainability, it's, you've got to look at yourself. You've got to look after. You've got to get your sleep. You've got to get your food. You got to. You've got to look after yourself. You have to have your knowledge. You have to do everything. You have to look after you before you can be any good to your team. That's what I. Yeah. That's my answer. The 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 way I coach the product owners is, you know, they need to have a vision that's so compelling the team will follow. And I use. Uh, uh, one of the best models for this is uh, there's a guy named John Boyd who is the best fighter pilot ever. Um, and he never lost aerial combat. He was called 45 second Boyd. He could have let somebody else get in his tail and in 45 seconds he had them. And he developed an analysis of the strategy and thinking in aerial combat that was translated into the whole strategy of the US military. During both Gulf Wars, they, they implemented his work. He, he, he educated the people in the war colleges. The Marines totally adopted. And it's been adopted in, in, in the military. So the, the loop that he talked about was, you know, it, it's called the OAD loop. You would say, okay, you need to observe, and based on what you see, you orient yourself in that picture. And that orientation is going to depend on your personal state. So your personal state has to be such that you can move in real time into the right orientation. Then the next step is decision, and then, then the fourth step is action. The goal is to move, is move the decision time to zero. So as soon as you're oriented, you're automatically acting. And that will put you inside the decision cycle of your competitor. So, you know, if you're a company trying to build a product and win in the market, you want to get your decision and, and your changing of your product inside the curving radius of, of the competitor. Now, when that translates into teams, you have to have a vision that's so compelling and an orientation that, at least to the team, appears so accurate that they will start to follow you before you even tell them what to do. Now that means you need to be a leader that motivates those people. If you do anything to compromise your personal integrity, they will not follow you that fast. If you tell them how to do stuff rather than creating a vision that pulls them, you will slow them down. The decision cycle will break. So. The, the, a good product owner needs to be a great motivator and a great leader. And the way he is personally, internally, he needs to be con congruent with that. And it needs to communicate non-verbally to the team.
So we've all, we've all heard, read about, or seen great leaders, political leaders, sports leaders. We know what they're like, and a great product owner is, is like that. And they may be imperfect characters, like Steve Jobs, who was one of the world's greatest product owners. But people would follow him anywhere. Thank you.